I want to start off today talking to you about the Black Gate. The American writer Paul J. Meyer tells the story of the Black Gate. And the story goes like this. A Persian warlord in the 1800s was fighting a battle in the Middle East. And in the middle of that battle, he took a spy. He took a spy from the other side and took him captivity. And the spy was questioned and sentenced to death. The warlord said to him, this is, I'm going to give you a choice, he said. You can face the firing squad of rifles, or you can go through the black gate and take your chances. I'll give you a couple of days to think about it. So the spy went and thought about it, and he thought about all the horrors that lay behind the black gate of this Persian warlord. And he thought about it for the couple of days, and on the day of his potential execution, the warlord called him in and he said, have you made your decision? Do you want the firing squad, or do you want to go through the black gate? And the spy said, I've made my decision. And calmly he said, I want to face the firing squad. And so he was taken away, taken into a back courtyard. And a few minutes later, the shots rang out. And the poor spy was shot. At that, the warlord hung his head and looked at his boots and said to his aide, you see, he said, that's the way it is with men. They would always choose the known over the unknown. What do you mean, said the aide? What lies behind the black gate? The warlord said to him, freedom, that's what lies behind the black gate. And I have known very few men who were brave enough to take it. You see, sometimes in our lives, we face known and unknown chances and unknown and unknown situations. And I want to look at those today, and I want to talk to you today about risk. I want to talk to you about risk. I was looking at it a little bit last week. My message today is called Risky Faith, and it's the real deal is what I want to talk about. I talk about the real deal of the risk that we take as faithful people of God. You see, just like the guy who faced the black gate, every one of us every day gets up to face the unknown. And sometimes we choose the known which is safer rather than the unknown which is riskier. And even as Christian people, we can live in a risk-averse way so that we live too safely to see anything wonderful happen in our lives. I want to look at some of the stories in the scriptures about people who took enormous risks of faith. And I want to look at the paradox of the risk of faith towards the end of this message. But first of all, I think it's important that we get a decent definition. What do I mean by risk? Here's what I mean by risk. Here's a definition. An action that exposes you to the possibility of loss or of injury. That's what I mean by risk. An action that exposes you to the possibility of loss our injury. It's that you take a risk on something and there's a gamble involved in it. I looked at it last week a little bit and I was looking at the story of the parable of the talents, which really is the story of the stewards or the story of the, the, the faithful and unfaithful servants, depending on how you look at it. And in it, we looked at some of the passages of scripture and we looked at specifically the actions of the last of the servants who actually failed the master because he was too afraid. I just want to recap on that verse just for a second. It says this, but the third servant brought back the original amount of money and said, master, I hid your money and kept it safe. I was afraid. He took what the master, who in this story was Jesus, had given him and he kept it safe. The problem was, is that it was safe and it was unproductive. And we have to make decisions. Do we want our lives to be safe and unproductive? Or do we want to take risks and bear fruit in our lives? You see, sometimes, and especially in the current culture, safetyism is everywhere. There is not an email or a text that isn't signed off. Stay safe. But that's not the way it has been for Christians and believers in God for millennia. Amen. The question is, that when we come to the question is, do we want to be safe or do we want to be strong? Because if we just live safe, for instance, parents who continually helicopter their parenting, their kids are continually keeping them safe, are actually doing them a disservice. They think that they're keeping them from, from harm or from trouble, but they're actually generating a whole mindset of harm in them. And they make fragile children and they make fragile kids out of overprotection. The question is, do we want our kids to be safe or do we want them to be strong? Here's what Paul talks about the experiences we have in our Christian life in Romans. He says this, he says, we can rejoice too when we 
run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us to develop endurance. They build the muscles of our faith. And I like he doesn't say, if we run into trouble, he says, when we run into problems and trials. It wasn't a question of if Christians would. It was, a, it was a matter of when Christians would run into problems and trials and whether we would see those trials as being against us or for us. And, it's, and, and, and it really is in a mindset. It is in a mindset. Some people, they go through troubles in their life and they think, no, God has abandoned me or why isn't God looking after this area of my life? When perhaps the view to take of it is, what is God doing with this to make me stronger in my faith? What is God doing in my life that is making me stronger? Maybe this trial is there to make me stronger. I like what the Roman um, politician and writer Tacitus said about safety. This is what he said. He said, the desire for safety stands against every great and noble enterprise. The desire to be safe stands against every great and noble enterprise. If we want to live safe lives, we will never ever be productive, certainly not in the kingdom of God, unless we take a risk, and it may be a risk with our reputation, it may be a social risk, a personal risk, a financial risk, a relational risk, a career risk. I don't know, you fill in your own blanks. But I, I, I honestly feel today that God wants to speak to his people clearly that you must, in this life, take risks. You must step out. You must step out over the line. And life is risky. And there is danger in it. If there wasn't danger in it, why would we need the faith that we so, so much hold on to? And when we look at the lives, I'm going to look at, for, at a second at a story of Paul. And look at the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, it tells the story of how Paul was on his way back to Jerusalem. And he was encouraging the churches as he was going through on his way to Jerusalem. But Paul was taking a huge risk. He was taking a huge risk because there was troublemakers waiting for him in Jerusalem. And you look at just two verses in Acts 20 and then four verses in Acts 21 that kind of spell out this picture. And I hope that God guides us as we read these words and encourages our hearts and builds us up as we read the words of the experience and the recorded history of Luke in the book of Acts. Here we go, we're gonna read these stories. Compelled by the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote, I'm going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. He meets with the Christians on his way back to Jerusalem. He says, I'm compelled by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit is telling me to go to Jerusalem. He's, he's telling me I'm compelled. There's, a, there's something in me that tells me I must go to Jerusalem. Remember, he's bringing back an offering. He's after taking an offering up amongst the churches that he planted to bring back because there was a famine in Jerusalem and the poor Christians in Jerusalem were going to be supported by this offering that Paul had. And he's on his way back and he says, I'm going to Jerusalem and I, I'm not knowing what will happen to me there. And then he says something interesting. He says, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. Now who, which one of us would eagerly step into a situation which clearly was going to be indicated by the Holy Spirit that prison and hardships were facing him? He knew that this was what was ahead of him. He was walking deliberately into the possibility of physical harm. He was running into the possibility of loss or injury quite clearly and he was doing it with his eyes wide open and the Christians around him were, 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 were kind of trying to discourage him as we read here now in Acts chapter 20 he says sorry he goes on to say this however I consider my life worth nothing to me my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me so he said I know where I'm going I know I'm going up to Jerusalem the Spirit is telling me to go to Jerusalem. I know that hardships and trouble wait for me. But you know what? I consider my life worth nothing to me. Oh, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given to me. Is that what's in our hearts, brothers and sisters? Is it the glory of God and his purposes that are in our hearts? Is that what's, is that what's motivating us? Has it motivated him. Are we willing to take risks to advance the kingdom of God? Because the kingdom of God will only be advanced. Jesus said the kingdom of God divorces fan, advances forcefully and forceful men and people take it forward. He meets up with the Christians, Acts chapter 21. He's on his way. He's not far now from his destination and he gets to a city called Caesarea and in Caesarea he meets the Christians there. And this is what happens. Here in Acts 21 that the believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not 
go on to Jerusalem. Hello? There's a contradiction here. Paul says he's compelled by the Holy Spirit. He says that he's warned by the Holy Spirit that trouble waits him. And now the believers are saying the Holy Spirit is telling you not to go to Jerusalem. I think the, whole, the believers were reading into the story what their own fears were. He says the believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go on to Jerusalem. No, you're not talking about some Johnny come latelys here. You're not talking about some people who didn't take their faith seriously. People who weren't genuinely converted and genuine disciples of Jesus Christ. These were serious Christians. The story goes on, and this is one of the best stories in the New Testament. It says, several days later, a man named Agabus, who also had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea. Mad Agapus, and he came over, and he took Paul's belt, and he tied it around, and he tied his own hands and feet with it. Imagine being at that meeting, when suddenly there's an uproar, and in comes Agabus, like I went for a kind of a bearded, long-haired, kind of standard prophet look. Maybe he was a very quiet fellow, and nobody knew anything about him, but I think he was probably a bit of a wild man. Anyway, he arrives in, and he takes off Paul's belt, and he ties his own hands and feet with it, and then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. He warns him, physical demonstration of what's going to happen to him. But Paul's eyes are wide open. He knows that there's a risk involved. He knows that he may even pay with his life, but he still goes in and he still takes the risk. Think about the risks that you have in your life, the risks that you may take in your life. Very few of them will cost you your life, I suggest. No, I'm not talking about reckless risks or stupid risks or, you know, I took a risk and I jumped off the top of the building in church and uh, guess what, the angels didn't show up and didn't save me. I'm talking about actually eyes wide open, I'm talking about proper risks, risks where we know that there's a consequence and they're not reckless or foolish. Paul was very serious in his commitment. Can you imagine what it was like to be in that meeting? When they see the prophecy and the dramatic arrival of Agabus and he ties himself up and he says, this is what the Holy Spirit says and everybody's listening on the edge of their seat. And they know, oh no, this is what's going to happen to Paul. And he says, when, he heard, when we heard this, we and the local believers, we begged Paul. So it's not only the gang of guys that are traveling with him, but the local believers and everyone's saying, Paul, please don't go to Jerusalem. You're taking a ridiculous chance. It's a ridiculous risk. You're going to walk straight into trouble. And they begged him. They begged him, and they were crying and all. They were upset. They were genuinely upset. They were fearful for their friend and for their leader. They were fearful for him, and they begged him not to go. You know, a lot of us would really struggle to get past somebody begging us not to do something. We'd say somebody was callous or cold or hard-hearted if you were begged not to do something. But Paul knew what he was doing, and he knew his God, and he knew that God was with him, and he knew that no matter what happened to him, God would be with him. And if it was God's will, he would be rescued. And if it was not God's will, he wouldn't be rescued. And this is what he says. Paul says, why all this weeping? What are you doing this? You're breaking my heart. You're breaking my heart. What are you doing crying and weeping and moaning? You're breaking my heart. I know what I'm doing. He was a very determined fellow. He wasn't going to be flip-flopped over with some sentimental ideas. He was very focused on his purpose and on his cause. And that's why he stands out. You're breaking my heart. He says, I'm not only ready to be jailed at Jerusalem, but even to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. He was willing to die for him. Not, it didn't seem to cost him a thought. He said, I'm ready. I know what my life is like I know what the purpose of my life is. I'm trying to take hold of that for which God took hold of me. And if I die, I die. What an amazing attitude. How many of us would have that attitude towards our faith or to any circumstance in our lives? And I love it says then, it says, when it was clear that we couldn't persuade him, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. They just gave up on him. Paul, you're a dead lost by. You're going, to, you're going to walk straight into the trouble. You're going to walk straight into the, into the trial. You're going to walk straight into the physical. You're going to walk into the risk. And you're going to do so with your eyes open. So let the Lord's will be done. See, when I talk about risks, I've never made, never taken a risk like this. I don't know very many people. I might know one or two who've taken risks as severe as this, who went into situations where their life itself was on the line. What are we to learn from that, however? I think what we're to learn is this, that life can be dangerous, that there is danger in life. There is danger when we step out for our faith. There is danger when we 
donate our money or whatever it is. If there is danger when we take career risks with our careers or with our homes. There is danger. That's what we learn. We learn that to take those steps of faith is actually very solid. I like what Paul says. Paul never lived a life that was covered with safety. When you read the story of where he, how far he had gone in 2 Corinthians, he lists all the things that he had been through. He was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was flogged, and he, he goes into this flourish in one passage. And here's what he said. He said, I have been in con constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. Danger was just part of his life and he accepted it as part of the life that he was living and accepted it as part of the call of his life. Paul wasn't going to be safe and unproductive. Paul was going to make big decisions and he was going to face the danger because he had a higher purpose in his life. You see, to live securely and to live safely normally means that we have lost touch with our purpose. It normally means we've lost touch with our purpose. If our only concern is for our own safety, or even if it is an overweening concern for the safety of those around us, it means we've probably lost touch with purpose. We've probably become disconnected to that which God has called us for. You know, if you're tuning in out there on Facebook or on Instagram, or you're tuning in on YouTube, wherever you're tuning in, let me tell you this, let me remind you of this. God laid hold of you for a purpose. He took hold of your life for a purpose. You have something in you that God wants to use to advance his kingdom. Amen. And so long as you decide to keep yourself safe, that kingdom will never advance. You will never be productive if your own personal safety is at the forefront of your mind. Let's look at some, some other people who faced dangers. I call this short piece, eyes wide open. Because all of these people went in to these situations, eyes wide open. See, we can think it's big people like Abraham and, and Moses and, and Paul and all these big guys. There's some small guys as well, or some maybe less known ones. People who took major risks and ran the possibility of loss or injury. Let's get this one, Rahab in Joshua chapter two. Rahab faces a, an upside and a downside risk. She invites in the spies who've come with the Israelites to spy out the city of Jericho. You can read it yourself in Joshua chapter two. And she runs the risk of two things. One, the risk from her own people if she's caught with the spies, and the risk two, that the spies will lie to her and that she'll be killed when the invasion comes anyway. There's a woman who took an incredible risk of faith and she took such a risk of faith that she ended up in the bloodline of Jesus she's part of Jesus lineage fantastic story here's this one Esther in Esther chapter 4 a Jewess a Jew who had been taken away to Babylon taken away to serve King Azarus and ended up marrying him ended up being taken in to his harem they became one of his wives and here she is this nobody in some senses who's brought into this incredibly important royal position but there's a threat to her people and she has to take a huge chance. And the line that comes from Esther chapter 4 is this. She says, I'm going to go in and face the king. Effectively, I'm going to ask him to defend my people. But if I die, I die. That's it. If I die, I die. And that was her attitude. So much was her sense of the real purpose for which God had put her in that pivotal position at that time. That she said, I'm going to take this chance and if I die, I die. How often would we save our faith or even in many areas of our life? If I die, I die. That's we've got such a hope beyond this life. This is only the start of our experience with God. And then I'm talking about moving on into eternity, keeping our eyes fixed not on what is seen but what is unseen because what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal, Paul wrote. Here's another one. What about the widow in 1 Kings 17? And I'm going to look at some small people, people whose lives maybe that we can relate to. There's a woman, her, she's a widow, she's recorded as a widow, she's not named in the town of Zarephath. It's recorded in 1 Kings chapter 17. The prophet Elijah comes to her town and he's hungry and he's thirsty and he meets this widow and he says to the widow, get me something to drink, can I get a cup of water? And he says, by the way, is there any chance you'd bring me a piece of bread? And she said, I have only a tiny piece of bread left, I have only a tiny piece of flour and it's to give to me and my son before we die of starvation. It was a time of drought and starvation. And Elijah said to her, he said, tell you what you do, Bake some bread and give it to me 
And I guarantee you, God says that you will always have oil and you will always have flour. If you give it to me first, you will always have oil and always have flour. And it continues on in Monks Kings 17 that they ate for several days and for several weeks. And it says very clearly, it says, but the oil and the flour never ran out just, uh, just as it happened in accordance with the word of the Lord. I want to say to you this morning that sometimes we have to take a risk with our resources. This woman took a huge risk. She literally ran a life and death risk to make sure that the prophet was fed first. She gave her donation, if you will, first. She gave away first and ran the risk of going without herself. But God honored it. God honored it. God honors our sacrifices when we do that. He honors the risks we take. He honors the risk of faith. Look at that widow. And why, why is she in that story? She's in that story, and I'll go one further. Because she was faithful in that little miracle of the oil and the flour, she went on to have a much greater miracle when her son was raised from the dead. But it was her faithfulness in the little became, became fruitful in the big stuff in her life. You can give us an amen out there if you like that. Amen. All right, just give us an amen out there. We're just looking for a few comments. Give us an amen, give us a like. I love my feedback from the congregation. No, no, you can't get it at the moment. Let's have a look at this guy. Here's an interesting fella, Joseph of Arimathea. It records, Joseph of Arimathea is recorded in Mark's Gospel, he's also in John's Gospel. And the story about Joseph of Arimathea is this. Joseph of Arimathea was rich, he was influential, he was connected, and he had a very high standing in society. He had a very high standing in society. It says in Mark chapter 15, strange enough, my wife Elma just produced the scripture that says, you know, just as you were talking about risk, I read this this morning. So this is one of my last minute edits. And I think it's important. Joseph was rich. He was prosperous. All he had to do was keep his head down and he was going to have a grand life for himself. He was going to have a grand life for himself. He had money. He had comfort. He had influence. He was popular. He was a good guy. He was one of the good guys. It says in Mark 15 that Joseph took the risk of going to Pontius Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus. He went to Pontius Pilate and asked for the body of a man who had been executed for treason against the Roman Empire. Like, talk about walking the line of risk. He knew exactly what the risk he was running was. He was going to get the opprobrium of the Jews who didn't like him and who certainly didn't like Jesus. He ran the risk of getting into trouble with the Romans because he was asking for the body of a man who was executed for treason against the Roman Empire. He ran such a massive risk and yet he took it because of his loyalty and his faithfulness to his Savior Jesus Christ. Remember? At that stage for Joseph of Arimathea, nothing to be gained. Jesus was dead. And yet he still showed his loyalty and ran a huge risk. You know, sometimes we have to run the risk of being unpopular as Christians. And I want to say to you this morning, for some of you out there, you know, me and Michael say, it's as easy for you, Michael, in your workplace. You're all Christians. Isn't it great? Do you know what? I didn't always work in a church. I worked in other places where I was ridiculed for my Christian faith. But you know what? They always knew that I was a Christian. That's not Mr. Great Michael, but I always owned my faith. Can I just say to you, you may be working in a hostile environment where you work. Listen, environments are getting more and more hostile to the Christian faith and to the people of faith, and especially the people who believe in Jesus. For various reasons, the culture is getting more hostile towards us. We exist in a hostile culture. It's not a favorable culture. But you know something? Sometimes God calls us to take the risk and stand up and own our we have to stand up and own the faith which we have in Jesus Christ. We have to stand up and take hold of the faith that we have. And we have to stand up and say, I am a Christian. And you know what? God will honor you if you do that. God will honor you if you step out and you take the chance and identify, self-identify as a Christian. I want to just assure you of that this morning. That I, and I feel genuinely this morning that somebody is being asked today to take a risk with their Finances are a risk with their resources and may God guide you in the steps and the choices that you make. And there's other people here and you're being challenged about your workplace to stand up and own your faith in your workplace. You know something? People may not like it, but they will respect your courage and respect your owning of your faith. And it's not all big guys and old guys. Here's a young man who took a huge risk. What about Paul's nephew? Oh, sorry, I clicked off my clicker. What about Paul's nephew? 
in Acts chapter 23. This is the nephew of the Apostle Paul, a young man he's described as. And a young man normally describes somebody who's probably in their early teens. He's a young man, like so many young men out there today. He's a young man, he's a young person, he's a teenager. And he takes the chance of going to the Romans to tell them about a plot that's going on against his uncle. He runs a huge risk of getting himself into trouble with the Jews. He gets himself into a risk of running into trouble with the Romans. And this young man has the courage of his conviction and takes the risk and steps over the line. And God honors it. And you know, he takes the chance because you know what happens to snitches? Snitches get stitches. That's what happens to snitches. And then when with the people who were planning to kill Paul, they were very, very serious about killing Paul. They had taken an oath that they wouldn't eat until Paul was dead. That's how serious they were. But God rescued Paul as a result of the intervention of this young man. Strange enough in the story, the guys who vowed not to eat until Paul was dead, when Paul was rescued, I wonder what, at what stage they decided to start eating again. When did they realize that they were beaten? When did they realize that they were beaten? Here's a man, no matter how young you are, no matter how old you are, no matter how prosperous you are in your life, no matter how influential or the position that God has given you, and no matter how perhaps people look upon you and don't think much of you, if you're a prostitute or a queen or a widow or a rich prosperous man or a young teenager, you must take risks for faith. You must take risks for faith. You must step out and own your faith. And you know, today, I want to say to you, God is probably calling some of you to take risks. Take a social risk. You know, sometimes when I talk about risk, Sometimes I talk about maybe, maybe the risk is asking someone out. Hello? What's wrong with that? You know, sometimes it can be hard to ask someone out or, or take a step in that way. Maybe, it's, maybe you need to ask for a pay raise in, in, in your work situation. And maybe you need to take a risk and step out. Maybe take the risk that they might fire you instead of giving you a pay raise. Who knows what your situation is? Maybe there's a social or personal risk. Maybe you're deciding, will I buy that house? Won't I buy the house? Well, you know, here's what the, the important thing to do is. I read Dietrich Bonhoeffer during the weekend. He was, a, he was a Christian martyr from Germany back in World War II. And he said this, he said, he said, to fail to make a decision or to fail to act may be more sinful than to make the wrong decision in faith and in love. Sometimes we do make the wrong decision. But if we do it in faith, if we do it genuinely and with the correct intentions, God will honor us. Even if we get it wrong. It doesn't matter. We did it right. And God is the judge of those situations. So no matter where you are in life, maybe God is calling you to risk it. Here's what John Piper, the American Christian writer, says about risk. He wrote a book called Risk is Right. Very good. Very short book. Check it, check it out if you can. It's on PDF all over the interweb machine, all over the, also known as the internet. Here's what he said. He said, to run from risk is to waste your life. Better to lose your life than to waste it. Amen. Better to lose your life than to waste it. You see all those people that we listed just a few seconds ago, and Paul who we looked at earlier, and you can look at Abraham and Moses and David, the list goes on. Why are they in the book? Because they took the risk. Because they ran the risk of losing their lives. They ran the risk of losing their lives. And instead, they choose, they choose to, to embrace the risk. Better to lose your life than to waste it. There'll be nothing sadder on judgment day than a wasted life, wasted opportunities that have come our way for which God will say, why didn't you act in that situation? Why didn't you have more faith? Because it does take faith to take some of the risks that we face in our lives today because there's so much talk in our culture now about reducing risk and being safe. We mustn't let that concept begin to creep into the rest of our lives and above all else so that it doesn't affect our lives and affect our faith. Remember this, God is with you. Now, like I said, I'm not talking about ridiculous risk. Life is risky. When you get out of the bed in the morning, you run a risk from the moment you get up in the morning until you lie down in bed at night, and even then, you could be running a risk. The number of people globally who die from slipping on soap in the shower is actually remarkably quite high. You're probably not gonna be eaten by a shark if you live in this neck of the woods, but you might be run down by a car. You see this, I mean, this is a kind of an iconic image 
all over the world. Everybody knows that the walk, don't walk signs, you know, so you know that that means stop and this means you can now cross the road safely. But not in Ireland, by the way. In Ireland, that means cross and that means stop. It's just strange. I think we think that the pedestrian crossing lights were invented by the British or something. I don't know what's going on there. But you know, for me, I must say, this is one of my weaknesses. I'm always crossing. The road, I'm always, we call it, jay, they call it jaywalking in America. I don't know what we call it over here. It's just stupid, I suppose. It's what we call it here. But I'm always ducking in between traffic. But it's a risk I know that I'm taking. I know I'm looking around, I'm checking out the situation, and it's just something that I do. I know, I know you're out there ready to write some comment about how lawless Michael is, and he even ignores the red man. He's awful. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is that life has risk in it anyway. There's risk in your life anyway. But you know the biggest mistake you could make, and that would be to run away from risk and as a result, lose your faith. Because faith, when you really boil it down, is about risk. That's what faith is all about. You take a risk, we take a risk, as it were, by faith, because by faith, we pray to a God that we cannot see. We lift our eyes to a heaven that we cannot see and we cannot experience. This is what we do. We commit our days into the God we cannot see. And yet we see that our lives are blessed and God watches over us. But there's a risk in it. Even making that first step of faith is a risk. I like, I quoted only a couple of weeks ago, I like what Blaise Pascal, the French theologian and polymath, he was a mathematician and all sorts. I mean, this guy was just a, just a genius. And this is what he said. He said, belief is a wise wager. If you gain, you gain all. If you lose, you lose nothing. Amen. You lose nothing. But if you gain, you gain everything. If you take the risk of faith, you gain everything. Everything is on the line. Happiness into eternity is available to you if you take the risk and you win. But if you lose, you lose nothing. What do you lose? Nothing. And here's, here's, what, here's what we face every day. Belief that God is watching over us and will take care of our needs is a wise wager. Wouldn't anybody out there say amen? amen? Belief that God is there for us when we go into work and that his Holy Spirit will guide us and give us courage is a wise wager. Belief that God is with you, that when you ask out that girl, they could bring it right back home. That if she rejects you, it's okay. God has a better plan for you. Would anybody out there say amen? amen. And you see, belief is a wise wager. Wager, and that's what I talk about. But there is at the end of this a paradox. Let me get to the paradox in a second. I just want to say it to you today, and it's really, really important that I boil this down to this. It's really important. There's people watching here today, and whether you watch today, whether it's real for you today, it will be real for you in the next week, two weeks, three weeks, or month, where you will have to take a risk on God coming through for you. That you will have to take a risk in a decision that you make. You may be buying a house, taking out a lease, applying for a job, speaking up for your faith, speaking up in your family or in your relationships. Maybe you're taking the risk of reaching out and ending a conflict that you're in. Maybe you're going to take the risk and ask someone for forgiveness and they might reject you. But I know this, you will face risks that are connected directly to your faith in God directly connected to your faith in God in the next days or in the next week. And my prayer for you is that you will take those risks, that you will not live a safe and unproductive life, that you won't get safely to the finish line, but you will be able to say like Paul, I finished the race, I fought the good fight, and I have won the prize. Because there's a paradox at the end of this for the Christian. And this is the paradox, that we are taking risk but at the root is incredible certainty. When we as Christians face whatever situations we face, and that could be a bad health diagnosis, it could be a layoff at work, it could be difficult circumstances in the home, I know this, that though we take a risk, we also have an incredible certainty. Here's what Paul writes in Hebrews chapter 13, just writing to the Christians, People who were actually in a lot of trouble. People who were actually getting into trouble for their faith. They were Jew from the Jewish background. And they were getting into trouble with other Jews for their newly found Christian faith. And he reminded them in Hebrews chapter 13. He said this. God has said, I will never leave you. 
I will never forsake you. Amen. Whatever you face this week, remember this. God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. You are never on your own, regardless of the size of the risk or the trial or the situation or the size of the storm that you're facing. You are never alone. And Paul, in writing to these Jews, is actually quoting from an older passage. He's quoting from the book of Deuteronomy when he talks about this risk. And this is what he says. Be strong and courageous, it says in Deuteronomy. Do not be afraid or terrified. Why? For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. I love it. Be strong. Be courageous. Take a courageous risk. Step out in faith. Make that choice. Make that sacrifice like the widow did and wait for God's blessing to come into your life. Speak up in that situation where you recognize that somebody's in danger like the teenager Paul's nephew did. And, or, or, or be like Esther who was willing to use her position, an incredible position of privilege, and she recognized that God had brought her to that point for that time and she spoke up and said, if I die, I die. Because don't forget, see this thing here? That's the bungee rope of God's presence that's going to be tied onto your feet. When you take that leap of faith, that's the thing that's going to hold you so that you don't plunge to your end. That's the thing that's going to hold you up. That is the sense of God's presence that will be on you as you take those steps, as you take those risks. There is so much more to be said about this subject, but I don't have time to talk about it now. Maybe we'll revisit it again in a few weeks time but this is what the Lord says for this coming week I want to pray this for you if you've got a situation today just bring it before your mind now if you if you know of a risk you're facing now or maybe this message and I hope it is is a challenge to you from God's word to take more risks for your faith to give more to serve more to speak up more to own your faith more Maybe there's a very big risk that you need to take and you really need to know God's assurance. Here's God's assurance. He doesn't offer a guarantee that everything will work out exactly the way that you have it planned. He doesn't. God works to his own agenda and to his own purposes in your life. But this is what he says. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified for the Lord your God will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm going to pray. But I'm not going to pray for long. I'm going to keep it short. And simple. Let's pray. If you want to, would you close your eyes with me out there, wherever you are? And when I'm finished, I'd love an old Amen, just so that I know that you heard the prayer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have called us to no ordinary life. You've called us to an extraordinary life. And just by believing in you alone, Lord, we take risks. We take social risks. We take relational risks. Just by trusting in you alone, we take those risks, Lord. I pray that whatever we face this week, we would face it with confidence. That we would assess the situation just like Paul did, just like Esther did, just like Rahab did. Lord, I pray that we would assess the situation and then make a decision that is based on faith, Lord. Knowing that that paradox is there in the midst of that risk. That even though we take a risk, which means we run the possibility of loss or of injury, whether it's injury to our reputation, or injury to our bodies, or injury to our minds, or whether it's loss to our pockets, or loss of face, whatever it is, Lord Jesus, whatever it is that we face this week, when we are in these coming weeks, or in these coming months, Lord, I pray that we would assess the situation, and then take wise, courageous, strong, brave steps of faith. I pray, Lord, that nobody looking in at this message today looking in at this service here today lord nobody would waste their life by trying to keep it safe jesus said whoever loses his life for my sake will find it lord i pray we would take the wise wager of faith this week in whatever we face whether it's a home whether it's a medical situation whether it's an educational or a financial or a relational situation lord i pray lord your holy spirit would take these words and apply them to the hearts and lives of your people. Guide us, direct us, speak to us, just as you spoke to Paul, just as you spoke to, uh, by the voices of others, to the likes of Rahab, and by the voices of others, to the likes of Esther, Lord Jesus. Speak to us, Lord, by prophet, or by sign, or by your word, Lord. But remind us that your Holy Spirit is with us. And may we take in our hearts today away the idea, Lord, that we should be strong and courageous, to not be afraid or terrified, 
For the Lord, your God, goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Praise God. He will never leave you nor forsake you no matter what you face. Brothers and sisters.